Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining our webinar, United Arab Emirates Personal Data Protection Law 2022, presented in partnership between the Legal 500 and Brazilians. My name is Alan Cohen. I'm a research editor at uh, the Legal 500. And before I hand over the uh, webinar to our panelists, I'll give a brief introduction of today's topic, which is about um, the need for a strong legal framework for personal data protection. The uh, webinar will highlight the compliance requirements and rights of the individual under the uh, UAE law, um, and will also address a list of um, technical measures which can help improve personal data protection. Uh, but first, let me uh, introduce today's panelists. Joining us as a panelist and moderator is Said Hassan Khan. Uh, Said, do you want to say a quick hello to everyone? So. Everybody knows where you are. Uh, Hello, Said. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Said has more than 20 years of experience advising clients on issues that relate to taxation, corporate regulatory compliance and uh, contractual obligations, and re representing them before the authorities. He's developed strong expertise in personal data protection and has gained an understanding of the underlying concepts and principles governing global data protection laws worldwide, including uh, the EU's GDPR. He has also carried out academic research on such laws in various jurisdictions and has written about the uh, differences between their core legal principles. Uh, Said is an advocate of the uh, High Court a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK, and a member of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Also joining us is Saifullah Khan. Saifullah is an interna international trade, IT, and policy lawyer at Brazilians with more than 20 years of ex experience working in various jurisdictions and um, serving a large client base, really. His areas of interest include uh, trade remedy laws of the WTO, the, the World Trade Organization, customs law, competition law, and data privacy. He also assists clients in the uh, preparation and review of privacy policies and intergroup agreements concerning cross-border transfer of personal data. Like Said, he's an advocate at the High Court and a member of the Chartered uh, Institute of Arbitrators in the UK and a member of the uh, International Association and, uh, of Privacy Professionals. Both uh, Said and Saifullah, I must note, uh, have contributed to the Legal 500 Country Comparative Guides 2022, where they have published uh, on behalf of uh, their firm Brazilians uh, in the UAE chapter for the Data Protection and Cybersecurity Law section. Uh, finally, we're very happy to have Antun Beiruti with us. <clears throat> Antun is a cybersecurity expert with 10 years experience in assessing and securing large organizations across the financial, healthcare, governmental and critical infrastructure uh, verticals uh, internationally and is currently uh, leading the consulting practice at Axum Technologies, a uh, cybersecurity company helping government entities uh, critical infrastructure providers and companies of all sizes remain secure against uh, today's rapidly evolving threat landscape. Um, Said, I'll hand over to you uh, in a moment, but uh, before that, I would like to let our audience know that uh, the session is interactive. Uh, so if you have any questions at any point during the webinar, uh, please submit them using the uh, Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we will put them up to uh, the panel once the presentations uh, are over. Um, yeah, well, okay, then, Said, I'm handing this over to you now. Uh, please feel free to introduce the topic further and uh, just lead the conversation, really get us on the way. Uh, thank you, Adam. Thank you for a very nice introduction <clears throat> and a very good afternoon, good morning, or evening to all the participants uh, based upon your respective locations. And thank you very much for attending this session. Uh, before moving on, I would briefly uh, describe and identify the topics that today uh, we panelists will be discussing. I will be discussing mainly about uh, some important concepts concerning personal data protection law and the obligations placed on the user of data uh, uh, personal data. Sapula will be discussing the rights given to the natural persons 
uh, under the legal framework and uh, about uh, provisions about the cross-border transfer of personal data and more importantly, what the user of personal information, the company's businesses need to do in order to be compliant with the legal framework. Then lastly, the Anton will be highlighting technical measures that needs to be put in place in order to secure the personal data. Uh, I will, with this, I'll be sharing my presentation with the audience. Ellen, you would uh, have to enable my sh screen sharing function. Absolutely doing this right now. And this should work now, Said. Yeah. Okay, I confirmed that. Uh, we can see a screen now. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, in United Arab Emirates, the personal data protection legal framework has three distinct uh, levels of laws. The firstly, federal decree law number 2045 or 2021 on personal data protection law. It is a federal level law and is applicable across the seven Emirates. Uh, this law has been come into force on January this year. However, we are waiting for the issuance of executive regulations. Once the executive regulations are been issued, then the law will be enforced or implemented within a period of six months following the issuance of executive regulations. Then two of the free zone, the financial free zone in uh, United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi Global Market and the Dubai International Financial Center, they have their own set of uh, rules and regulations concern, concern, concerning personal data protection. Uh, now I would uh, highlight before the audience the basic purpose, why the laws about personal data protection are being uh, introduced and implemented and enforced all across the world. The basic purpose of this law is to, 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 to govern, to provide a framework to, to use for the use of personal data of the national persons. And in this mechanism, uh, the user of personal data are being given with obligations in order to protect the rights of the natural person. And of course, there is a regulator who is to, who is to regulate and enforce the uh, whole mechanism of, uh, of processing the personal data. Mm -hmm. Uh, this screen will uh, quite uh, easily show the very purpose of the law. In fact, uh, the legal framework everywhere in the world regarding personal data protection uh, has three interrelated spheres. At the first uh, instance, there comes a natural person, like we all are natural persons who are termed as data subjects. So the natural persons are the major uh, stakeholder under this law to whom excessive rights are given in order to protect their privacy. Then comes the people who use the personal data of these natural persons. These people or these companies are called or termed in the, uh, under the legal framework as data controller or the data processor. So because they have to use the personal information of the, uh, of the natural person that, uh, and, their, uh, and they have to enforce the rights and give the rights of the data subject. Therefore, this legal framework places heavy obligations or the, or the rules to be followed by the data controller or the data processor in order to process the, this very personal information. And at the third stage, there comes a regulator whose job, whose function is to monitor and regulate the whole law. And in UAE, the, uh, the, the regulator name is Data Office, who is responsible under the legal framework to regulate and to monitor the processing of personal data under the law. Uh, there are certain important concepts uh, within the legal framework, which are too necessary to understand the whole picture and why, uh, what is the concept behind the law and what the law requires from each one. For example, I mentioned that, that there are three interrelated spheres. So these definitions or these concepts are important to understand uh, the key functions or the key rights given to the natural persons, the obligations placed on the data controller and the role and functions of the uh, regulator. So I will start with the uh, definition of personal data. The name of the law is itself 
personal data protection law. So the, it is very important for all of us to know uh, what is the definition of personal data. The legal definition as is given in the law is appearing on the screen, but uh, without going to the legal details, I would say in very simple words, any piece of information which can directly or indirectly is able to identify a natural person, it is a personal data. Quite obvious examples are my name, my telephone number, my passport number, my voice notes, and my photographs. These all are the personal data. The next important concept which I would like to highlight is the sensitive personal data. The sensitive personal data is included within the definition of personal data, but is kept separately because there are some more strict conditions under the law in the, for the data controller or the user of data uh, person data to process the sensitive person data. And the sensitive person data are like health data, uh, criminal records, or religious or philosophical or the political views of the natural person are sensitive person data. Uh, the next uh, concept is data subject. So we all natural persons are the data subject. Every natural person, a human being is a data subject whose personal data is being subject to process by the user of the um, information, any company, any data controller, who is using personal information of a natural person. So that natural person is a data subject within the legal framework. And now two important definitions of the concern need to be understand very, uh, very carefully because uh, the main topic of my pres today's presentation is about the uh, obligation and the requirements placed on the user of data, uh, person data. So these are the controller and the processor. So one has to be very clear whether I am, uh, I am using or I am processing the person data in the capacity of a data controller or a processor. So the data controller is the person who decides or determines the use of personal data. So it is his authority when, uh, uh, for example, an employer has the decision, has taken the decision to, to use his employee's data. So he's a data controller. So he has his, uh, taken his decision to uh, process the data. Whereas the a processor is a person, a processor is a person who only acts under directions of a data controller. He himself does not uh, decide to collect the data, but he acts on the instructions of a uh, of a data controller. So, in simple words, we can say he is a uh, he it or a company processor data processor is a service provider. The next concept is very important. Again, it is consent. Consent is the single major and significant basis under which data can be processed. So, a controller, which I define or explain, or a processor, can only process personal data of a natural person with his express consent. If there is no consent, the uh, the data controller would not be able to process the personal data. Uh, the last two definitions of the concept which I would like to highlight here are processing and the what is personal data protection. So, for a definition of processing in the law is uh, quite inclusive, and it uh, starts right from the collection of data. Till, uh, and to every action which is done after the collection till is eraser. For example, sharing, exchange, destruction, eraser, everything is part of the processing. Uh, now the personal data protection, what is the personal data protection? Under the law, the personal data protection means all the technical and organizational measures which a data controller or data processor is required to take under the law in order to protect the personal data. So uh, we'll discuss it more in more detail about uh, the technical organization measures, uh, how and when they are need to be taken. Uh, um, here I'll be referring uh, an example just to distinguish or differentiate what piece of information is personal data. So in this uh, slide, the very first email address, which is info at company.com, it is uh, not a piece of personal information and it does not reflect, it does not identify a natural person. Whereas the second example, john at company, uh, at the rate company.com or john.smith at gmail.com, these second and third email addresses are directly identifying a natural person. So these both are come within the definition of natural uh, uh, personal data. So as I said that the purpose of the law is to, to uh, one, one of the purpose of the law is to uh, place certain obligations on the data controller and the data processor who use the uh, 
personal information of the natural persons in order to protect firstly you know, firstly in order to protect the uh, uh, pro protect the privacy of the natural person and secondly in order to process the information only in accordance with the law so uh, the first principle which you need to follow is the the personal data must be processed law with lawfulness fairness and transparency now what is the lawfulness lawfulness means that there must be a specific purpose to process the personal data for example an employer can use or process the data of his employees for the purpose of exercising their employment so this is a legal purpose this is a lawful basis and uh, what is fairness fairness is something that the data must not be used in a way which can which can cause some harm or damage to the natural person it should be used in a fair way uh, to explain the concept of fairness, I would like to have an example. Like uh, uh, the authorities, in order to assess the tax liability, uh, may process the data of national person that may, in a way, has some damage to the person in order to increase or decrease their tax liability. But the proper use is fair because the tax authority is choosing the data according to the law. So they are very fair with the natural persons. Then the, the third principle is transparency. Data controller or data processor must always be transparent. They must tell why, who we are, why we are using your uh, information, and they must be open and transparent and honest with the, uh, uh, with the data subjects. The next concept, the next principle and the obligation which data controllers and data processors need to fulfill is purpose limitation. What is purpose limitation? That means that a data controller can only process the personal data for the specific purpose for which, for which they have initially obtained the data. They cannot go beyond the purpose for which they have taken the data. Uh, as an example, I say the, uh, the employee, uh, again going to the employer example, if the employer has taken medical information, for example, the blood group or some allergy information to his employees, it can, uh, it can only be used for this purpose while in the emergency or giving due medical treatment or for the healthcare treatment for his employees. The next principle or the obligation uh, which is placed on the data controller is data principle of data minimization. Data minimization principle is that data controller must not have in control excessive data. Data controller must only have the minimum amount of data under which he can fulfill the purpose for which the personal data is being obtained. So this is called the principle of data minimization. Then another uh, obligation and the principle which data controllers and data processors are, are to fulfill is accuracy. The data kept by the data controller must always be correct and updated. Uh, whenever a data controller comes to know that the data he, he is uh, holding is incorrect or need updation, he needs to be updated. And also, Sepula, during his presentation, will talk about the rights of the data subjects. So data subjects have the right if they know that my data is inaccurate or uh, out, outdated. So he has to, uh, he or she can approach and request the data controller that please correct my data. So that's why the data controller is to keep the data accurate all the time, but it's own motion or when it is brought to his notice by the concerned data subject. The next principle of the obligation which is placed on the data controller is storage limitation, which means that uh, data controller cannot keep the, late, uh, the personal data for a lifetime. They have to delete or erase permanently once the purpose for which data was initially obtained has fulfilled. Once the purpose is fulfilled, there is no legal lawful basis remain which, which validate their further continuity with the data controller. Uh, I talk about the uh, definition of personal data protection. So uh, the data uh, controllers and the data uh, processors are applied to make all efforts to make sure that the data with them is secure. When we say uh, security, that means the data is safely stored, number one, and secondly, it is protected from any breach. It is protected from any vulnerabilities. So how a data controller and the data processor can ensure that the personal data they are keeping 
is safe, is uh, uh, safely kept, and it is protected from breaches. So there are two measures, which uh, two uh, sorts of measures which a data controller and data process are uh, applied to take. Firstly, the technical measures, and secondly, the organizational measures. Anton will be discussing more about the technical measure, but I will briefly say that uh, a data controller is required to uh, have in place uh, for technical measures system security, his system, computer, network, uh, database, <coughs> server should always be secure. Then the data security itself. First, they have secured their systems, then the information contained within the system must be secured. And there's a concept of online security. If a, if a company or a data controller for that matter is providing online services, its website or online mobile application, so they have to uh, um, take technical measure to ensure the online security of personal data. Then the device security. The, uh, the computers and the mobile phones and the handheld devices all need to be physical secured. So these all covered under the technical measures. Now, uh, the second aspect of the, of the security measures is organizational measures. So what does it mean by organization measures? The measures which organizational as a culture or a system within, uh, within an organization has to take in order to protect the, um, uh, the, the personal data they have been keeping. So the, the organizational measures include, firstly, to having and to create a culture for awareness at all levels of the organization, starting right from the board level, C level, uh, executive, and all the staff. There must be a sense of responsibility and sense of and sense of uh, protecting the privacy of the people to whom they are dealing with. Secondly, the organization, uh, the second uh, aspect of the uh, organization measure is to have a risk risk assessment. This is a risk assessment, which means that the organization must carry out a detailed plan, uh, detailing their all activities of the processing to, to know them that where there are weak areas so that can focus on these weak areas in order to more efficiently protect the uh, privacy of natural person. Uh, because the organization is bigger and small, so this is a very specialized topic. So that why uh, the third uh, point in relation to the organization measure is to nominate a focal person. A lead person or the uh, or the focal person within a company who is whose main responsibility is to deal all the privacy related matters within the organization and outside the organization. Then obviously the companies would read a well documented policy and procedure, standard operating procedure in place, and more importantly, all the staff with all levels must be adequately trained how to use and how to apply these policy and procedures. Then the companies, uh, as an organization measure, they must have also a business continuity plan, a written documented business continuity plan, because the business continuity plans helps organizations to, to, take, measure, to take appropriate measures just in case there's uh, uh, some breaches happen, what to do and what not to do. And then obviously, uh, I would say that companies or the data controllers for that matter, do not uh, wait for the happening of something bad. So they have always be a, a system of periodic checks. Before, in between, after three months or each quarter, they must have a review all their organizational and technical measures to just to check their appropriateness and effectiveness in the system. Another obligation which uh, data controllers have to fulfill is to record keeping. Uh, data controller or the data processor, for that matter, both have to play uh, to. Uh, to uh, to keep the records of all their uh, processing activities, which include the very first, uh, initially, the purpose of the processing, why they are processing the data. It's very important to record it there. Then what types of or categories of personal data they are using for, they are only using or processing names, or they are using the bank account details, or they are using passport numbers, or they're recording their images or the photographs or the voice records. So they must have to have a record of all sorts of all kinds of personal data. Then what are the time frame? Uh, I mentioned that uh, there's an application that they, the personal data must always be deleted once the purpose is fulfilled. So they must record the time frame when they are going to delete the data when their purpose is completed and the scope of processing. And the, uh, the, the record keeping should also show the, uh, the mechanism, how the data can be updated, modified, or uh, how it will be erased. And I just mentioned about the, uh, the technical and organizational measures. So, so this uh, technical and organization measures should also be recorded in a written format as part of their uh, record keeping requirements. 
The lastly, it's very important thing I mentioned about the consent. I will uh, I will speaking more about the consent. So the whole process of consent, how it was obtained, who has given the uh, consent, what was written in the consent, is need to be recorded and keep a record by the data controllers. Now I will explain more about the consent because I mentioned earlier that consent is a very basic and fundamental basis under which a data controller can use person data. If there is no consent or it is not a valid concern, consent, then data controller may not be able to use the personal data under the framework. So uh, I, will, uh, I will explain what are the essential of a valid consent. It must, firstly and foremost, the data controller must be able to demonstrate as an evidence that he or it has obtained a consent. If it is not, data controller is not able to demonstrate to evidence that he has obtained the consent, it means that there is no consent. So very importantly, uh, data controller must always be able to, uh, to demonstrate that it is obtained the consent. Then uh, the consent will be specific, very clear. No ambiguity will be there. And there must be some, uh, the data subject have to be an active, taken some active statement or a clear affirmative action to, to con convey his consent. There must be a clear, there, uh, uh, there must be an aggressive and a clear affirmative action on part of the data subject to exercise the consent or to give the consent. And again, the, uh, 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 the data subject must have a very clear and easy right to withdraw the uh, consent. Again, I will uh, refer this, uh, this, uh, this validity essential about withdrawal with the fairness and transparency. So it's a principle of fairness. It is coupled with the uh, principle of fairness and transparency that the uh, data subject must have been, uh, must allow a fair and easy right to withdraw its consent. And again, because uh, in the commercial world, while a data subject is giving his or her personal data to the uh, to a company, so there may be some commercial terms. So the consent must be very separate, concise, and uh, different from the other terms and condition for which the data is being sent. So there must be clear and precise and separate uh, uh, consent apart from all terms and conditions. Now the, the method of the, uh, to obtain the consent can be a documented basis, a signature, a, a physical signature, or to meet be through an interface through internet or the computer. So either it is uh, through a written based uh, consent or if it is via uh, a interface through computer, uh, what needs to be included in the consent document? Firstly, the name of the organization, who is data controller? why it is obtaining data and the, uh, and the third parties to whom this data controller will be sharing this information based on this concept and how the data controller will use the data. So this will or this information must always be there in, the, uh, in, in any form, either the computer interface or the written document uh, to have a valid consent. Now, how to obtain record and manage the consent? So it is a requirement that uh, very important requirement is that the data subject must be given a free choice to give his consent. He must not be forced. So again, this principle goes and linked with the fairness and transparency. And the second is that uh, use of pre-check box or pre-populated check-in box or check-out opt-in box or out box is against the uh, the standards of valid valid consent. So if uh, we are given a choice with the pre-text box, so it's not a valid consent. So and another uh, requirement is when a data controller is taking uh, different, uh, is taking the, is collecting the personal data for different purposes. So it has to have a consent for each purpose differently. Separately, he has to um, uh, obtain the consent for each purpose. Again, easy option to withdraw the consent must be there. And importantly, uh, the data controller has to keep records of the consent. And lastly, uh, there should be a policy to regular review of all the consent. This is why, because subsequently, before after taking the consent initially, there may be some circumstantial changes which may uh, which require the data controller to use data for some other purposes. So that's why there should be a regular policy to review the consent so that if there is if there is any subsequent change, so update the uh, the, uh, the consent mechanism. Here I would like to, to quote a couple of examples just to explain a little more about, uh, about the concept of consent. In this case, uh, a person is uh, using, who is a data subject, is uh, making an uh, online account with the online retailer. So the online retailer is a data controller and the user is a data subject. So 
uh, the statement which appears is, please do not send me the following types of communication. And there's a free text box in the news. So firstly, this use of free text box is against the condition of valid consent. Secondly, uh, uh, there's a need to give attention to the, uh, to the statement which the online retainer has provided to the data subject. It is a misleading because they, uh, it is asking the user which information you do not want to have. So just by default, if a data subject do not tick a box, any box, then by default, this information will be sending by the data controller to the data subject. So it is not according to the valid condition of the consent. In this second example, uh, uh, a website, uh, while uh, accessing a website, uh, a browser with a natural person with a data subject is given this notice to use of privacy and the cookies. Again, the data subject has not given any free choice to exercise his right of giving consent. The data subject is given only one option just to continue. So in that matter, he, is, he or she is compulsory to follow, continue. So this notice or this kind of uh, information is also against the uh, condition of valid consent because the data subject is not able to exercise his free choice. Uh, I explained about the uh, technical and organization years in order to keep the data secure. So what is data breach? Now, the data breach is whenever and due to an unauthorized or unlawful access, any loss is happened to the personal data, like any unlawful transmission, unlawful, trans uh, un unlawful transfer or destruction or modification, this is called data breach. Now, whenever it is a data breach under certain circumstances, a data controller, is to notify to the authority, the, uh, the public sector authority, which is data office, and also to the data subject about the breach. So when a data controller is required to, uh, to give a data breach notification, when there is a serious risk to the, uh, the, when the breach is likely to result in a serious risk to the privacy, confidentiality, or the security of personal data. Uh, the law has also provided uh, what needs to be mentioned in the data breach notification. So when a data controller under the circumstances is required to give a, a data breach notification, so the data breach notification must contain uh, a description of breach, what happened, and uh, what are the potential effects of the breach, uh, and more importantly, what my year's data, subject, uh, da uh, data controller has already taken in order to minimize the negative effect or to mitigate the effects of the breach. Now I will discuss the, the position of data protection officer. Uh, DPO, the data protection officer, is required to be appointed by data controllers and data processor, but not in all cases. In certain specific cases, when there is high risk to the processing, and when we say the high risk to processing, that means there is high risk or likely high risk to the, uh, to the, to the natural person. So when the processing is likely to result in a high risk, when there is a high risk to the privacy of the individual, or when I mentioned while defining the sensitive personal data, that there are more strict conditions to process the sensitive data. So one of the instances to appoint the data protection officers where when the data controller is processing large scale of sensitive personal data. Uh, the functions and the responsibilities of data protection officer are quite clear because the main purpose of his, his function or his appointment is to, to monitor the compliance of the uh, data processor and to advise the data controller about their due, uh, due uh, responsibilities under the legal framework and also to act as a contact person between the data controller and the regulator. Uh, lastly, I would uh, just uh, highlight that uh, Non-compliance of the legal framework result in uh, imposition of fines. For the uh, UAE federal decree law, a cabinet decision is yet to be issued to define the level of fines. Just for a comparison purpose, I would like to refer a few other jurisdictions, including two in UAE, the level of fines. In uh, GDPR, the maximum fine is 20 million euros or 4% of the global revenue, whichever is higher. And for uh, ADGM, Abu Dhabi global market, the maximum fine is US dollar 28 million. And for DAFC, the maximum fine is uh, 500,000 US dollars. So that end my presentation. And now I will uh, hand over the floor to Stefan Khan to start his presentation. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Saeed, uh, for a wonderful presentation. Let me share my presentation. Um, first of all, uh, hello and assalamu alaikum to all the participants. Yeah. Okay, so Saeed has elaborated uh, in quite a detail about the basic principles of this uh, data privacy law, not only of the UAE law, but also um, other jurisdictions like GDPR. I would uh, actually focus on the rights of data subjects under this UAE uh, law, then cross-border transfer of personal data, and finally, what needs to be done by the data controller and the processors who are in UAE or even who are outside the UAE who, can, who comes under the ambit of this uh, law, what they have to do. Um, regarding rights of the data subjects, uh, one of the basic right is the access to information. So uh, the data subject, the individual, the natural persons, they have the right to ask the data controller about the categories of data they are possesses, the purpose for which they are processing your data as a data subject, and with whom they are sharing the data. So the right of access allows data subject and individuals to, to get all this information from the data controller. The second one is right to personal data portability, which means that once you go to a particular organization who is a data controller and you give your thumb impression, you give your picture, you have the right to receive uh, systemized and uh, portable machine portable data from one data controller to another data controller. So, so this portability provides you a space, a room for fast processing of your data uh, if you want to convert it from one controller to the other. Then comes the right to rectification or eraser. If as a data subject, I believe that my data with the controller is incorrect, I can ask him to rectify and correct it. And if I think that the data with the controller is uh, now um, does not have any lawful purpose, I can ask the data subject to erase my data from his system. Uh, the the uh, Saeed has very rightly and discussed about the consent management system that how important the consent is. Uh, to take the consent from data subject for data controller. So if as a data subject, I'm, I'm withdrawing my consent, which that, that would mean that I'm asking my data controller to erase my all personal information from its database. The next right is the right to restrict processing. So what does it mean that if I want my data, my personal information not to be processed for a specific purpose or for a specific time period, I can ask uh, for the restriction of processing for a particular time period. For example, if I if I get an information that my, my data is being processed for a non-agreed purpose, the purpose which was not agreed by myself, I can ask my controller, data controller, who is processing my information to please restrict processing for a particular time period. Right to stop processing. Now, stop processing means uh, you are asking the data controller to just stop the processing and do not do it furthermore. And this can be done if, if you think that your data has been used for uh, free marketing purposes, or if you think that uh, your data has not been processed uh, under the legal framework in place in the UAE. So you can ask for the stop processing of your data. Then comes the right to object uh, to automated decision making. Now, automated decision making actually means that uh, the, the decision has been taken uh, um, purely on the data analytics uh, and there is no human mind applied. Uh, for example, um, uh, one good example could be that if, if some um, criminal uh, person with a criminal background has been fined uh, for some traffic violation more than the normal fines just only because his uh, criminal record, historical record, we uh, uh, believe that he had a bad record previously. So that would not make sense actually, because you cannot process um, the personal information only on analytics without applying your personal mind. That uh, criminal person should have uh, applied the, uh, the, the, um, the fine should be as per the uh, complaint, as per the uh, grievances. You, know, you cannot do it only based upon the analytical results. Uh, the next section is the cross-border transfer of personal data, which is really very, very important. Uh, the question is whether the personal data can be taken out of UAE. Yes, it can be taken out of UAE, but there are certain conditions attached to it. For example, the first condition is that the it can only be taken out of the UAE 
to a state or a territory which has adequate level of protection, which has the same level of uh, data protection law in place in that jurisdiction as well. And the data subject has been given the rights uh, that they can, they can take action against the data controller in that jurisdiction by either using the uh, executive authority in that particular country or, or, or resorting to some judicial forum in that particular country. The second option you have is to, um, if, if, that, if that state or territory has a bilateral or multilateral agreement with the UAE. Currently, yes, we know there is no bilateral or multilateral agreement in place, but this is another one way of uh, transferring personal data from one jurisdiction to another. Uh, bilateral multilateral agreements are expected to be uh, quite common in, in the next few years in different jurisdictions. Um, another option is the, uh, the executive regulations, which are yet to be issued. What we believe is that once the executive regulations are uh, issued, there will be more controls and there will be more explanation about the uh, requirements for transfer of data from UAE to outside UAE. Um, within the same context, I would, I would like to also highlight one important provision, which is the extraterritorial uh, applicability of UAE uh, data privacy law, which is not only applicable in UAE, rather each and every uh, data protection law in different jurisdictions, they have extraterritorial applicability, which means that, the, that this law will not only apply to the companies who are established in UAE, even if the data controller or the processor resides outside UAE, and they are processing personal data of the natural person data subject who resides in UAE, even then this, this law will apply on them. So, um, so the, the companies who are outside UAE, stationed uh, outside UAE, they have to be careful that the applicability of this law is also uh, on them as well, and they have to comply with the provisions of this law. Okay, now, very interesting uh, topic is what needs to be done by the data controller and the data processor. If you are collecting information of individuals uh, who are data subjects, what, what needs to be done by you? What do you have to do? You have to carry out data mapping now. First of all, you have to start with data mapping, which means that you have to take stock of all personal data which you are collecting um, right from the collection, transfer, its usage, and storage. And, and that whole mapping exercise should be done to, to begin with this process. And you need to identify and categorize the type of data you are collecting. You are collecting emails, you are collecting phone numbers, you are collecting banking details or whatever. And whether how consent is obtained, Saeed has already explained that it is very, very important to have a very proper documented consent management system in place. Um, you have to define the purpose of collecting the data and you also have to show it to the data subject, then whose data is being collected. Uh, access control, you have to provide access to the uh, data if the data subject asks for it, and you have to keep all data secured. Uh, transfer data, uh, data transfer security, both internally and with the third party. Sometimes it happens that you process the data yourself, which means the data controller, data processor is the same entity, it's the same person. So you have to have internal and an, an internal security system, which ensures that there is no leakage of personal information. In other cases, when you are a data controller and you outsource processing a function to somebody else, third party, uh, to process the data, that means that controller is different, processor is different. In such a case, you have to make sure that the data processor to whom you have assigned this task already have a very good security system in place. Because if they do not have the proper security system, then you will be penalized as well as a data uh, controller. So this is really, really very, very important. Furthermore, what you have to see in the mapping exercise is timing of data collection, um, then the where you will store your data and the security measures and the name of the third parties with whom you will share this data either uh, for processing purpose or for any other legal purpose uh, by taking consent of the data, data subject. And then finally, the data retention that for how long you need to lawfully keep that data with you because you cannot unlawfully keep the data for an indefinite period with you. You have to define that period and take the proper consent uh, from the data subject as well. Once you are done with the mapping, what you have to do next is, now you have to make an assessment of your overall impact about the data landscape, which means that you need to uh, have a detail that whether you are processing information of employees, you are processing information of suppliers, you are uh, processing personal information of your customers. So you need to have a proper landscape. 
Then you have to establish how data was obtained and whether a fully informed consent has been given by the sub data subject. You have to create a data processing register. Now, this is really very important because the data processing register will incorporate, will have the details about the storage of data, the transfer of data, uh, for what purpose it is used, with whom you are sharing this data, all such information should be registered. So that is called a creating a data processing register. You have to be able to recognize and respond to the requests from data subjects. Saeed has explained that the uh, obligation of the controller that if you receive a request from the data subject about the access, about eraser, so you have to respond to it properly. How you can do that? You can only respond if you have a proper response system available with you. Whenever you get a request from the uh, data subject, you have to respond it quickly. I'll give you, I will give you some example that there, there is a one example I have it with me that uh, the, the Clearview AI in France, they have been penalized by the French Data Protection Authority amounting to 20 million euros in the year 2022. Why? Because this company that does not facilitate the exercise of data subjects' right of access. They were not giving, they were not exercising the right of access of the data subjects, and they were only providing data access for 12 months period, immediately preceding the request period. Um, then they were restricting their, uh, their, their, their uh, number of frequency. So they were only giving twice a year, the, uh, they were entertaining only twice the uh, data access request of the data subject without any justification. And finally, what they were doing is they were res responding to certain requests after an excessive number of requests by the same person. So they were not responding to all the uh, data access eraser requests of these data subject. They were restricting uh, the frequency of uh, you know queries coming into them. Based upon these uh, non-compliances, they were they were imposed penalty by the French authority amounting to 20 million euros. Um, so so one more example uh, regarding the data automation, which I had explained earlier, was regarding uh, food in ho, and they were penalized 2.6 uh, million uh, pounds because it was a grocery delivery services. And they were they failed to obey the uh, GDPR rule on automated processing, and they also failed to comply with the GDPR uh, rules regarding lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. So the point I'm trying to make here is that the, as a company, as a data controller, as a data um, processor, you have to respect the right of data subject, and you have to respond to them quickly. The next point was ensuring capacity building of employees. Obviously, it is very important so that your employee should be ready to respond to the vulnerabilities and the data breaches timely all the time. You have to be always transparent with the data subjects. You, so you have to tell the data subject who you are and why you are uh, taking their information and for what purpose you are going to use it. If you are going to share the data with the third parties, you have to please tell them that we are going to share with third parties and this is the list of third parties. If the data subject allows you to do that, only then you can do it, otherwise you cannot. Uh, you have to continuously review your existing business processes to make sure that you are complying with the uh, legal framework in the UAE. You have to decide about uh, whether you need a DPO. Said has already discussed about the requirements of the DPO. So you need to assess whether you, 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 you process that sensitive kind of data that you need to hire a DPO for full time. Uh, you need to modify and review your update uh, agreements because the, currently the agreements are keeping in with your internal processes of security, but once the law is there, once the law is applied, you have to uh, comply with the legal provisions of this new law. So you need to modify your agreements. You have to document your policies and procedures for sure. It is a regular process. And this is what we are doing now for the companies, our clients in UAE and even outside of UAE. And um, we are advising them to prepare a compliance checklist and it's protocol review, which is extremely important because the compliance checklist and the review will uh, give you a comfort level and ensure, uh, give you assurance kind of a thing that you are properly uh, uh, complying with the law and, and there are least chances of any breaches and there are least chances of getting any sanctions and penalties from the authority. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This is all what I have to say right now. Uh, thank you, Sefula. Uh, for a very brilliant presentation. Now I would uh, hand over the um, forum to Anton to begin with his uh, presentation. Over to you, Anton. Thank you, sir. 
So uh, today we will be discussing the relationship, the very complex relationship between cybersecurity and compliance, and which one can help you achieve the other. So uh, let us start by discussing a little of the background of compliance and regulations and how they transitioned into the digital age. So before this digital age, mainly regulations were focused on financial services and maybe on protecting clients and personal information. Uh, just a second. Uh, mainly to protect organizations and to protect clients and their personal inf uh, information from any illegal activities. Uh, with the transition to the digital age, uh, we can notice one thing that the purpose of the attacks and the threats remain the same, but only the methods have changed. They have been digitized, if you want. So in the past, if someone were to try and commit fraud, try to extract some personal information about a client from a bank where they work, for example, they would need to go into an office, let's say, uh, search for the files, retrieve the paper files, and then they would be committing fraud. Uh, in today's world, they would need to use a set of credentials to be able to maybe bypass authentication processes, log into an application, maybe use a vulnerability exploited to be able to extract this information from the application. However, the purpose has remained the same. This is why regulators have tried to adapt this, and they are doing this by introducing regulations that are more and more focused on cyber and information security and privacy. So if we look at this evolution, so from uh, paper-based, let's say, regulations to regulations that are more uh, focusing on cyber and information security, since the purpose is still the same, uh, we can try and understand why, uh, in the eyes of many organizations, compliance is still unfortunately re re regarded as only a legal issue, and it's not being seen as uh, uh, as an enabler for cybersecurity. Now, this issue, it does not lie with regulators. So uh, you have read a lot of regulations, those data protection regulations that we have seen with Mr. Saeed, Mr. Saifullah, all of those, you see that there are some statements or clauses that are related to information and cybersecurity. However, those are very vague. They are not very specific. But regulators have to do this because their regulations need to be compatible with the largest number of organizations. Those vary in sectors, size, etc. So the issue lies, therefore, on the receiving end. So in our line of work, we always see organizations that fail to grasp what is the main purpose behind a regulation. Regulations, we need to understand, they are not there for regulators to make money, for governments, for governments to make money. They are not there to make your life more complex, although most of the time they will do that. But the actual purpose of a regulation is the mitigation of the risk. So how, how can I mitigate the risk of uh, com uh, fraud being committed to one of my citizens, one of my residents, one of my employees, for example? How can I protect them? How can I mitigate those risks? This is the main purpose of any regulation. The resulting problems for this are the following mainly. So organizations, and we see this a lot, they tend to cut corners. So they want to become compliant without necessarily being actually secure. And it is cheaper with a small star here, we'll get back to this later, and way easier to view compliance as a checkbox exercise. And we say cheaper with a star because it is only cheaper until you are breached and you will be breached. So whenever you say that you are compliant, you are certified against a certain standard, you are compliant with a certain law, a certain regulation. This actually, because you are not looking at this from the proper perspective, this provides a false sense of security. So let's say, for example, you have helped your organization uh, achieve certification with the ISO 27001 standard. You have now an information security management system and you have the certification, you're very proud of it. However, this certification, it says that you have identified your risks and you're working on treating them based on a well-defined risk treatment plan. Now you go to your management and you ask for additional budget to be able to mitigate those risks that you have identified. And the management might say, but we already have the certification. Doesn't this make us secure? 
this is here the false sense of security that comes with just being compliance based on a check, checkbox exercise that has been done. So what would be the, risk, uh, the solution? This is something that Mr. Saeed mentioned, the need to have a risk assessment. So we need to focus on risks and risks and risks because everything would revolve around risks. You need to identify your organization's risk appetite. And by this, we mean what is the level of risks that I want to accept in my organization. Anything above this level needs to be mitigated. Then you go and check your regulations. You want to achieve compliance with those regulations. So you need to select a set of controls. How do I select those controls? Do I just take the vague statement from the regulation and try to explain it based on my experience, based on my understanding of a very vague statement? Of course not. You need to look at your risk assessment. What is the outcome of this risk assessment? What are the controls that will mitigate the risks that you have identified and bring them to a level which is within your risk appetite? This is how you should be able to select your controls. So we need to focus on one thing, which is that compliance and regulations should be the trigger that will help you kickstart your security journey or improve your security. They are not the end means. You do not become secure just to be compliant with the regulation, but you can take advantage of this regulation that has been uh, put there for you and use it to become more and more secure. Let's take an example. So uh, from the Abu Dhabi Global Market Data Protection Regulation, there's an extract. They are saying that the controller and the processor, they must ensure, for example, the ability to restore the availability and the access to personal data in a timely manner in the event of a physical or technical incident. So let's look at this a little. We need to be able to restore, if we have any incident, to restore and make sure that the data is available and in a timely, in a timely manner. So how do I look at this? Well, if I'm not looking at the risks, if I won't just want to comply word by word with the regulation, I can just back up my data daily on an external drive that I have purchased. I take this drive with me, of course, home. I keep it home because if there is a physical or technical incident at the site, it should not impact the hard drive, which contains all my data. I store it home and there you go. And I, I'm there, therefore compliant and I have saved a lot of money for management, but I did not mitigate the risks and I will be breached. And then I will be forced to pay the hefty fines that the previous panelists uh, mentioned. And I have not protected my business. The proper way to do it would be, I look at the risk assessment I have, that I have conducted and the controls that need to be selected to make sure data is available in a timely manner are implementing two online backups and one offline backup because I need an offline backup in case I am hit with a ransomware, for example. And the offline backup should be stored securely in a secure location off-site. Well, if I look at this, I am compliant. I have mitigated most of the risks. They are well within my risk appetite. However, this is an expensive solution. So how can I get management buy-in to be able to implement this expensive solution? If we look a little, if we zoom out and look at this relationship between us professionals and senior management. So legal compliance and cyber professionals, all of us should listen better and better to the business owners and their needs because let's face it, the end purpose of any process or any department is to help empower this business. This, is, this should be the end purpose. So what we need to do is, in terms of cybersecurity, we need to align the security strategy that we develop to the business strategy and make sure the security becomes an enabler for the business instead of an expense. We can also focus our risk assessments on the impact to the business. So if this risk were to be materialized, what would be the impact on our sales? What are the impact on the resources we have, financial resources, for example? How would public perception be impacted? How would our clients look at us? Will they start looking for a competitor? Will they leave us? Will they still be with us? This is where we should focus our risk assessments. And we need also to turn security from a cost center to a business differentiator. How do we do this? So we have the steering committee meeting 
with the business owners and we are discussing what they want and they tell us we want to save money. So we can show them how the right controls properly implemented can prevent risks and can prevent those hefty fines that we have discussed and thus can save us money. Businesses want to increase sales, for example. So we can show them how improved security and improved compliance actually <laughs> provides a competitive advantage and brings more clients, for example. Now I'd like to end this on a final note, and I think this is something very important that we should keep in mind. We should know that if we are being compliant, this is a good thing, but this does not necessarily mean that we are in an appropriate security posture. And you should also know that you will not mitigate all the risks to a, a tolerable level by simply being compliant. You might mitigate some of them, but you cannot guarantee that all of them have been mitigated. And finally, you will not be able to escape financial losses, sanctions, fines, and reputational damage simply by being compliant. But however, if you have selected the appropriate controls across people, processes, and technologies, and if those controls were selected based on the outcome of a risk assessment, a proper risk assessment covering the whole enterprise, if you are monitoring your controls for their effectiveness and improving them continuously, then you will most definitely comply with the security requirements of any existing and new regulations that you might have. Thank you. That's all I have for today. Back to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Thank you very much for a brilliant presentation. Uh, we have received a few questions so absolutely we're running over this so, all but uh say please uh, you know take some time to answer some of the questions Ellen, can you please help me to find absolutely so uh so we have, we've got questions question regarding the recording so yeah the recording will be sent uh upon uh request so that's not a problem at all there was a question that came in uh, quite early when you were speaking, Said, uh, asking if uh, you know the, the content required is also limited uh, with a time frame. Yeah, I can see no this concern. Uh, an anonymous attendee has asked this: Is the consent required to be limited with a time frame as well? Yes, as a matter of transparency, the consent could be time assigned. So, for example, uh, a data controller may only have a consent for for one year or six months, and after six months, if he still need to process the data, he will have to uh, obtain a fresh consent. So, another question is a difference between controller and processor. So, a controller is a person or the company or the business who basically decides to collect and process the data, whereas the processor is a service provider who only acts under the instructions of a controller. I'll take a couple of more questions from the list. Uh, can, I, can I add one thing on this question? Yeah, because I, I had also explained that there could be a possibility that controller and processor could be one person. The controller can also process the data uh, himself or itself, or uh, the processing can be outsourced to third party. Uh, Saeed had explained in his presentation that controller is the person who actually takes the decision for the collection of data for some lawful purpose. Whereas a processor it can only process the data. He does not have the authority to decide about collection of data for it uh, for specific purpose. Uh, Mohan has asked uh, the next question, who regulates? So under the law, uh, in UAE, uh, under the federal decree law, a data office is there to regulate the law. And for the time being, uh, digital telecommunications and, regulatory, uh, and uh, digital government regulatory authority is uh, taking care of the law. And uh, for DIFC and uh, ADGM, they have their own commission of data protection who control the, uh, this subject matter. So, so you mean to say data office is not established yet? Uh, once the regulation comes into play, the data office will be established. Yes. And for the time being, who is taking care of this? For the time being, who is uh, authority? For, for the time being, uh, DTRA, D, uh, Digital Telecommunication and Government Regulatory Authority. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. Yeah. And another question is there, can controller transfer data to third party who are outsourced to process data abroad? So uh, this is a, a mixed question. Firstly, yes, a data controller can transfer data to third party. But your question is, 
to uh, to, uh, to to sending the data out to the UAE. So for which um, Sefula has explained there are two conditions. Firstly, that other country where the data processor is based, it must have adequate level of protection means the same level of protection which the UAE law is given. And secondly, uh, the other uh, situation is where the United Arab Emirates has entered into a bilateral or multilateral agreement for the protection of personal data. So only under these two uh, conditions, uh, personal data can be transferred to a outsourced person who is a processor outside UAE. There is a slightly more technical question. Um, maybe, I don't know if it's for you, Saeed, or for you, Saeed, uh, uh, like I can read it out. Um, retrofitting consent on uh, existing customers is harder than collecting consents from new customers. What happens if no consent is received? Surely commercial practice will avoid disconnecting service from such customers. Yeah, actually, it is a really uh, a mixed commercial and legal uh, question. Exactly, the legal position is that you have to have a consent uh, out of that. But if uh, some customer do not give uh, the consent, uh, they will be uh, they will be having two things. Firstly, the business will lose the uh, lose the business uh, or the or the transaction. But at the same time, that customer will not always will also not be able to acquire the services or to obtain the goods and services. So there is a trade off between. So if the data subject really wants to enjoy the service or goods offering from a data controller, so he have to has give the consent, although unknown. Uh, knowledgeable, fair and transparent consent requirement is there. Okay, very interesting. Uh, do you want to take a, another couple of questions, Said? Uh, I think uh, the question already covered, but now yes, I will I think ask most... uh, Sefula uh, to please uh, offer a few words as a concluding remarks for today's session. Over to Sefula. Uh, you're on mute, so for that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you, Alan. Um, uh, before before Alan officially uh, concludes the session, I would just say a few words that uh, Saeed had uh, earlier pointed out uh, during his presentation that the executive regulations, once they come into force, uh, the companies will only have six months to have their regulatory framework in place, which we believe is uh, not a good enough time. So the companies who are serious about, or most of the companies, they should be serious about uh, complying this UAE the new law on uh, personal data protection. They should start preparing their compliance framework now. And uh, especially if I talk about the extraterritorial, um, uh, you know, applicability of this law, um, I, I think the companies who are either subsidiaries based in UAE or a branch office of foreign entities, they also have to be vigilant because this UAE law applies to them as well. So it, it equally applies to the companies who are established and working in UAE or the companies who are a branch office or a subsidiary of a foreign entity working in UAE. So everyone has to comply with it. So they have to be vigilant. Um, and we are, uh, interestingly, we are we are receiving a lot of queries uh, uh, even now from, from US, UK, from Singapore and Hong Kong, even from China, we have received a lot of queries in UAE uh, for the uh, extraterritorial applicability of of the law of UAE on other jurisdictions because a lot of companies in these countries, they have their branch offices in UAE, they have their subsidiaries in UAE. So they have to be vigilant that once the private data, personal data is transferred to their head office or to their parent companies, uh, they have to comply with the law. And um, I would like to thank uh, those uh, participants who have uh, made this possible today to attend this session. And uh, we are we are welcome to answer all your queries. Uh, uh, please feel free to send us your queries on email and we will respond to your uh, individual queries as soon as possible. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I thought it was remarkably interesting, actually, and I'm sure it was very uh, useful to the audience. Uh, a huge thank you again to Bizalens, to you, Saeed, to Saifullah, to Antun, and to the audience today. Um, most questions from the audience were uh, entered by uh, Saif. So thank you for this. But uh, as you said, Saif, like, if, if anyone has uh, any further questions, uh, please do not hesitate to contact uh, Vizilens. And uh, well, we hope to see you uh, at another webinar shortly, everyone. Goodbye.